Hello all, this is Umesh History Faculty at Manifest IAS and this is the Current Jobs Initiative and as part of this initiative we have already covered the World Heritage Sites of India which have been recognized by UNESCO and nearly 30 cultural sites have been covered as part of this series and we have we had a thoroughgoing discussion on the architectural features and the significance of each cultural site of India and nearly 8 natural heritage sites are still left out and it will be covered as part of our environmental initiative. And today we are going to have a look at the intangible cultural heritage of India which also has been recognized by UNESCO. And when it comes to this intangible cultural heritage, UNESCO it has a very broad understanding of the term culture. It does not confine culture to some tangible, uh, tangible elements of history. It thinks of culture as a way of life of people. So that is the reason why what it does is it goes beyond the tangible heritage of the world. It also recognized some of the heritage, heritage practices which are intangible, which don't have any material or physical form. But in spite of that, they are very significant culturally for a given population. So this kind of intangible cultural heritage, it covers the living expressions and traditions of the world, living expressions and traditions of the world. And along with that, it, talk, it covers skills, knowledge, expressions, representations and practices, as well as artifacts, objects, instruments and cultural spaces associated with them. So all of these aspects, they are put together, form a part of the intangible cultural heritage of the world. And when it comes to this, the, there is an elaborate selection procedure for in, intangible cultural heritage of the world. And this selection pro procedure, it um, is based on this Intergovernmental Committee for Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, whose, whose members or member states are usually elected by the United Nations General Assembly. So, Intergovernmental Committee for Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage is the organization which selects the intangible cultural heritage. And before this organization, usually the state parties or the countries of UN, they put up a dossier about their intangible cultural heritage and based on their cultural significance or diversity and creative expression these are selected by this intergovernmental committee for safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage subscribe now and press the bell icon never miss an update now if we have a look at there are nearly three lists which are part of this intangible cultural heritage. The first and foremost is the intangible cultural heritage which is in need of urgent safeguarding and no site from India is part of this urgent safeguarding list. And the second one is the list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity and many Indian intangible cultural heritage practices are part of this cultural heritage of humanity and the third one is register of good safeguarding practices and this section it does not include any intangible or good practices from India. So there are a total of three three sites and three different categories or lists and Indian sites are part of only one list which is intangible cultural heritage of humanity and the main purpose of inclusion into this UNESCO world heritage list is that it will ensure visibility and awareness about the said practice for the people across the world. It's not just about India because of their outstanding universal value and it also uh, the selection criteria is also based on widest possible participation of the public and the free prayer and informed consent of the public who practice this intangible cultural heritage. It means that the people themselves should voluntarily come forth to UNESCO in order to get their cultural practice as part of UNESCO intangible cultural heritage and at the same time this uh, UNESCO listing it will give greater visibility and awareness for the people for and it will help in sustenance of a said intangible cultural heritage. So that is the reason why the countries they vie with each other in order to include their intangible cultural heritage as part of this UNESCO list and in India in India, there are many practices which can form part of which form the form part of this intangible cultural heritage. Okay, and along with this, India is a land of these kind of practices. Okay, there for every street there is a different kind of culture. There is a different kind of practice. But all of these cannot be possibly included, and definitely only few of these have been included. And as part of this some of the important festivals of India, okay? Some of the important festivals of India like Kumbh Mail and Nauroj have been integrated as part of this series. When it comes to Kumbh Mail, 
the kumbh mel has a lot of mythological significance historical significance and the current practice is considered to be the world's largest religious gathering the first and foremost we will have a look at the mythological significance when it comes to the mythological significance it is part of the hindu puranas which is known as samudra mantana in samudra mantana the gods and demons okay they put together they churn the milky ocean churn the milky ocean which is known as samudra mantana and at that point of time in a picture the amruta it comes out out of this four drops fall at different places on in the in india and these four places are nashik in god on the river banks of godavari haridwar on ganges ujjain on shipra and alahabad where you see the confluence of ganga yamuna and mithilkal saraswati river so at these three junctures nearly four drops of this amrut it falls that is the reason why at a specific astronomical times these rivers they convert back to their initial purity and that is and this mythological significance it forms basis for the kumbh mela and in fact The, there is also a list, lot of historical precedent for this kumbh mela the first and foremost is this person by the name of adi shankara or shankara acharya shankara acharya is the one who instituted this practice of con- conducting kumbh mela at these four junctures he considered this to be a very very important for religious gatherings and discourses so that is the reason why he constituted this central practice of kumbh mela which has been earlier mythologically practiced as makara kumbh or makara mela which became kumbh mela after adi shankaracharya and the chinese traveler huan zhang he very clearly uh, speaks about this practice this practice and along with that if you have a look at if you have a look at this uh, kumbh mela it is considered to be the largest religious gathering it is practiced at nearly four places and it is practiced in a cycle of 12 years let's suppose if a place in a place if in one of these four places if the kumbh mela is conducted once then for nearly 12 years it is not conducted again so it means that they come and in a cycles of 3 to 4 years in a cycles of 3 to 4 years based on the astronomical positions of various uh, stars and planets this is considered then along with that what people do here in this religious gathering is hindus from across the world they come to these rivers and they take the ritual holy dip which is considered to actually cleanse people of their previous karmas so that is the reason why the ritual dip is very significant and along with the ritual dip at this juncture you see the sanyasis from various regions of india gathering together in this mela and these sanyasis they give a lot of philosophical and ritual discourses and people consider uh, listening to these discourses as very auspicious then along with that because of the huge gathering of people nearly 60 million people also gathered uh, in 2013 i think 60 million people gathered in 2013 so it also becomes a place of a community gathering along with the community gathering this also play becomes a place of charity houses and many many folk traditions of india uh, are also practiced at this uh, at this juncture in kumbh mela that is the reason why it is a very very auspicious and intangible cultural heritage of india and it has been included as a part of the intangible cultural heritage of the world and this kumbh mela it also has a lot of significance for indian national movement too particularly the far right of indian nationalism they always associated themselves with this kumbh mela the organizations like vishwa hindu parishad the universities like banaras hindu university the initiation for all of these things it occurred at the kumbh mela even the hindu mahasabha also was established after discussions were done in the kumbh mela so that is the reason why it is associated with so many things and it is very significant for us and the next one of significance is the navaroj festival the navaroj is the festival of parsi community in india the parsi is a very unique ethnic minority of india and these parsis when it comes to their historicity they come from the central asian region particularly particularly the regions uh, the region in central asia like uh, the regions in central asia like turkmenistan kazakhstan and today's iran and afghanistan from this region they have come initially the parsis are a very very prominent community who followed the religion of zoroastrianism the zoroastrianism is one of the ancient religions of the world in fact it is uh, it is considered to be even equivalent in age to the vedic religion of india the vedic religion of india and it is practiced in central asian uh, region and their central religious text is jand avesta and their main god is ahur mazda and this parsi community they were very prominent in 
the ancient world and they established many prominent empires too. One of the most prominent empire is the Sassanid Empire during medieval period. And this Sassanid Empire, this Sassanid Empire, it was defeated by the Islamic invaders from the Arabian Peninsula. Once this Sassanid Empire was defeated by this Islamic invaders from uh, from the Arabic Peninsula, they started persecuting the people who follow this Zoroastrianism uh, as a belief system. That is the reason why many of them they converted to Islam, but some of them they wanted to stick to their old faith and they started migrating to India in ships and through land too. And in as part of this migration, they came to the Gujarat coast first. And in Gujarat coast, the Indian rulers they invited this Parsi community to settle down in Gujarat region but they have put some restrictions like that these people should follow the local language first and local marriage traditions and local dressing traditions because of these three restrictions the Parsis as a community they lost their origin original Persian language and they started speaking in Gujarati and Marathi and some of these Parsi communities who are micro minority they are predominantly settled in India and Pakistan today and they have some unique pr uh, practices like their burial practices when it comes to their burial practices it is very very unique it is a partial burial uh, technique wherein they feed their dead bodies uh, to the vultures so this is a brief introduction to the parsi community and when it comes to their festival this festival is very very significant for them which is a navaroj festival and it is conducted typically on the day of equinox on the day of equinox this festival is con is conducted and it is also known as jamshed in navaroj because the person who uh, started this person uh, this practice is known as Jamshed who is a Persian king and in fact this Navaroj it is a new year day for these communities and along with the Parsi community even some of the sects of Shia and Sunni Muslims also celebrate this festival as a new year for them as a new year for them and this is done on the vernal equinox when the sun migrates from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere on the day where the e there is equality between or equal length of day and night on that day this Navaroj festival is conducted and it is a festival where communities gather together they exchange gifts and along with that there will be a very uh, very good meal which follows this all of these things are part of this Navaroj festival and because of the micro minority uh, religion that Parsis have today uh, so that is that is the reason why micro minority religious practice it is a, it in fact a uh, dying tradition that is the reason why it has been inscribed as intangible cultural heritage of the world and on the same day they visit the fire temple because the Parsis they believe in the god of fire and uh, there they worship the sun god and moon god who are part of Zoroastrianism by the name of Kurshid and Bahar. Not very significant for us, but at the same time, Parsi community, it had a major contribution for India. Some of the most prominent personality of personalities of India, like the Tata group, they belong to the Parsi community. Many prominent entrepreneurs, they belong to the same community. Then along with that, there are many personalities who are part of Indian national movement, too, like Dada by Naurochi, and many cultural per personalities like Freddie Mercury. The part who is part of the Queen's band, all of them belong to the Parsi community of India. Now, moving on to the next uh, intangible cultural heritage, the next one is the Buddhist texts or the chanting of Ladakh region. Okay, the Ladakh region's Buddhist text chanting is very very significant. See, when it comes to the history of Buddhism, Buddhism as a religion it spread to Central Asia from India, and as part of this spread during the Kushana period, Ladakh became. Ladakh became a very prominent center for Buddhism and particularly the Mahayana format of Buddhism is practiced by the people who are living in Ladakh region and later during medieval period this Mahayana Buddhism was further influenced by the Vajrayana sects and it is considered that the Buddhism as a religion it went to Tibet from only Ladakh region and in this Ladakh region uh, there is a practice of chanting of Buddhist texts which is very very prominent and which is uh, done in the monasteries usually it is done on the days of life cycle rituals like birth ritual death ritual on the day of puberty and these kind of life cycle rituals they they uh, actually chant the Buddhist texts because they considered it to be very auspicious and as part of this uh, they this Buddhist chanting it is considered to bring about the progress of individual life and at the same time it is also considered to develop the universal peace and as part of this chanting they invoke gods like Buddha, Bodhisattva and uh, and one more uh, important person by the name of 
Rinpoches, okay, Rinpoches who are highly regarded religious teachers in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. So Bodhisattvas, Buddhas and Rinpoches, all of them, they are invoked as part of this Buddhist chanting and it is uh, sometimes uh, done in a very, done along with musical instruments and dances and sometimes it is done just without any music or dance. It is sometimes done in the monasteries, sometimes in the houses too. There is no set hard and fast rule for the practice of Buddhist chanting, but it requires enormous amount of practice on the part of monks in order to perfect this art of Buddhist chanting. That is the reason why it is considered as an intangible cultural heritage of the world, intangible cultural heritage of the world. And this, there are some very prominent monasteries which practice this uh, technique of Buddhist chanting. One of the most prominent is the Alchi Monastery which is present in Ladakh region and it also contains many uh, traditional paintings of Buddhism known as Thangka paintings. Thangka paintings, wall scrolls are also there. They uh, also uh, they also worship the Buddhist uh, deity by the name of Tharas. Okay, Prajna Paramita Thara, she is very very prominent and they are also worshipped as part of Ladakh's practice of Buddhism. And today it is a union territory and the practice it still continues it still continues okay next one is the tradition of Vedic chanting the tradition of Vedic chanting it is also a very prominent tradition of the world when it comes to this Vedic chanting Vedas they are they are supposed to be heard they are not supposed to be read on a textual format in fact the vedas initially during the rig vedic samaveda ajurveda period they were never written down they, it is considered inauspicious for them to write down and at the same time the vedic aryans they did not have a script of their own so that is the reason why till late ancient period none of the vedas are ever written down ever written down they were recited by the people okay and it has continued from guru sishya tradition and gurukul tradition the vedic chanting it has continued and the vedas are also considered to be shruti literature shruti means something which has been revealed by god and because of this revealing by god people considered it to be inauspicious to write them down on one side and at the same time the way the god has revealed these vedas to the to their pupil, you know, to the rishis of ancient world, not pupils, but to the rishis of ancient world, the same kind of annotation, the same kind of pronunciation should be followed. That is the reason why they were never written down. And if we have a look at it, then obviously this is the longest surviving oral tradition of the entire world because the early Vedas they were composed. Uh, nearly in 1000 BC. From 1000 BC to now nearly 3,500, nearly 3,000 years have lapsed. 3,000 years have lapsed. That is the reason why this is considered to be one of the very very important uh, cultural heritage, intangible cultural heritage of the world and even today there are many branches of recitation of Vedas. Okay, the Vedas are not recited in one single format. The oral rendition it is done in a nearly 13 different formats of recitation and these 13 recitations are just part of nearly thousand which used to survive during ancient period and when it comes to these recitation practices recitation practices they are known as patas pata means the practice of recitation in a different fashion sir. so this is uh, the vedic chanting of ancient india and the verses they have been preserved as they have been pronounced in ancient time and it is also considered to be very auspicious for a person to listen to the vedic chanting and it also is considered to restore the balance of the natural world all of these are associated with the Vedic chanting and even today the Gurukul tradition is still continuing. You can find many Gurukuls where the Vedic chanting is considered at a done in a very auspicious manner. It is not done in a careless manner. In fact, it takes years of practice for a person to actually chant the Vedas as they are. So that is the reason why it has been included as intangible cultural heritage of the world. Okay, I have included some of the some other information too because the sound which has been produced while reciting this Vedas is considered to be very very prominent and there are many shakas of reciting these Vedas too and because sometimes it is also considered to be Shabda Brahma. Shabda Brahma means something which liberates just by the sound. The Veda chanting if it is a listen with the proper annotation and connotation it is considered to be a liberating experience. That is the reason why okay we have talked about the Vedic chanting of the ancient India, ancient India, which is continuing till today, and all the prominent Vedas, Rig, Sama, Yajur, and Atharva Veda, all the four Vedas are also recited by using this fashion. And the next one is Yoga, which is a new addition to uh, the UNESCO World uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage Series. And when it comes to this Yoga, Yoga is a ancient Indian practice, and Yoga is not just confined to 
the breathing exercises yoga is a way of life of ancient india and it is associated with indian culture in various format various formats the first and foremost is yoga is an orthodox school of hindu philosophy this is very very significant it is an orthodox school of hindu philosophy and it is based on the philosophy of duality or dvaita okay if you see it matter soul distinction is the central element in fact it shares this idea with the sankhya school but at the same time the term yoga it means union it means union union between the individual body and his mind along with this individual souls unity with the universal soul in fact this school it differentiates between prakrit and purusha prakrit is the nature and purusha is the person and this purusha he is one with the universal soul that is what is known as yoga yoga means union yuj it is based on the word yuj which means union and in fact this school it is a part of orthodox schools of hinduism and it the founder of this yoga school is considered to be sage patanjali but in fact there are many historical precedents to this term yoga in fact in veda in the vedic literature also you find the term yoga in upanishads you find the term yoga and buddha buddhism and jainism also practice some of the yogic practices of ancient india and apart from that if you have a look at yoga is considered or defined by this person patanjali as chitta vritta nirodha it means that the waveringness of the mind is stopped by yoga that is the meaning of yoga which is a chitta vritta nirodha and it contains nearly eight practices i think you might be knowing about the yama niyama asana pratyartha pranayama and dharana and samadhi so these are the eight or astangas of uh, yoga these are also part of the yoga philosophy then apart from that during medieval period yoga got associated itself with the tantra and as part of this association with the tantra it for it or evolved into a new format which is known as hatha yoga and in hatha yoga the main concentration in is on raising the kundalini energy of an individual so that is how it got associated with the tantric practices and it became hatha yoga and yoga as a philosophy it has been taken to the western world for the first time by swami vivekananda okay and he is the precursor or he took the yoga not as a physical exercise but a way of life to the western world and after that the physical practice it became more prominent and some of the most prominent indian gurus like bks ayengar marshi mahesh yogi all of these people they carried the, this philosophy of yoga to the western world and today we have seen that the indian yogic practice okay devoid of its spiritual element it's just as a physical exercise it has taken many forms in the western world today it is a multi billion dollar industry in the western world and there are practices which are a mockery of the ancient indian practices like goat yoga today so these kind of things are happening but it has a deep significance spiritually with respect to the indian culture and the tradition and across religions yoga as a practice is followed in india it is not just confined to hinduism in fact islam was also influenced by this yogic practices in fact some of the sufi saints like chishti sufi saints they followed these hatha yogic practices hatha yogic practices in ancient or in medieval periods and they were always associated with this siddha yogis siddha yogis who are part of this hatha yogic tradition and the main text of these people is hatha yoga pratipadika hatha yoga pratipadika all of these aspects are part of this yoga philosophy and that is the reason why it has been included as intangible cultural heritage of india and yearly every year a annual yoga festival is also construct, uh, conducted in rishikesh and now we also have the world yoga day world yoga day so that is the reason why yoga is a very important traditional practice of india now we if we have a look at the next practice which is known as sankirtana sankirtana is a very important traditional practice of india particularly with respect to the region of manipur manipur in medieval times it got converted to hinduism and vaishnavism it has been significantly influenced by the chaitanya movement of bengal which formed the basis for gaudiya vaishnavism this gaudiya vaishnavism it spread slowly to uh, the manipur kingdom which is being ruled by the meeti rulers who followed some uh, initial tribal practices at that point of time these people the king in particular he was influenced by vaishnavism and he had taken over uh, the or he got converted to vaishnavism and after that slowly the vaishnavism as a movement it became more prominent among the meeti community in manipur and slowly it got it got hinduized this is the process of peasantization of tribals or not just peasantization but hinduization of tribals is 
uh, followed here wherein the people got slowly acclimatized to hinduism and they got converted to hinduism and after that manipur is very prominent for some of the classical dances of india like the manipuri dance form and apart from the manipuri dance form sankirtana is one more unique aspect of manipuri uh, of manipur culture and when it comes to this sankirtana it talks about the leelas of krishna it is an enacted play of the leelas of krishna wherein krishna and his leelas are enacted through songs through music and through dance format and this is typically conducted in the mandapas of a temple mandapas of temple and it is also considered that in dwapar in kali yuga in kali yuga the way to attain moksha is only through sankirtana earlier through karma through uh, through many other means people used to attain moksha but through only sankirtana in kali yuga uh the moksha is attained this is the belief of the manipuri vaishnavites manipuri vaishnavites and they typically recite the many names of lord vishnu then they perform uh, the krishnasa uh krishna's uh, antics during his stay in vrindavan all of these things they perform and it is also practiced across not only in manipur but in tripura and assam wherever the meti community is present all of these places this is considered this is uh, practiced and there are many different methods of practicing it natpala arabi pala manohar pala and shanya all of these aspects are also part of this and when it comes to the musical instruments which are part of this there are pung and kartal pung and kartal are the two major instruments which are also used in thangta martial art dance form and along with the that it is also used in the manipuri dance form and chulums is a method of dancing is a method of dancing which is highly masculine in its aspect so all of these are part of the sankirtana dance form this is one of the images and usually there is a huge community gathering here and people uh, undergo religious ecstasy to as part of this and some of the people they cry you can see these all of these aspects as part of this sankirtana and in fact it has been started by a person by the name of uh, shankar deva not shankar deva i am sorry chaitanya mahaprabhu of bengal region and some of these sankirtana tradition it is also inspired by the ramanandi sampradaya of ramananda okay so two important people one is the chaitanya mahaprabhu and the second one is ramanandi sampradaya both of them they inspired this manipuri tradition of a sankirtana and today nearly 40% or 42% to be precise of a meti community in manipur they belong to vaishnava community and they practice or they continue this practice of a sankirtana singing and Uh, next next important one is the chahu dance which is a semi classical dance form of ancient india semi classical dance form of ancient india uh, this chahu is practiced particularly in eastern india in the states of gujarat sorry in the states of odisha jharkhand and bengal these three states they follow this chahu dance form it is initially considered to be a tribal dance form and later it got itself acclimatized with some of the classical dancing traditions of india along with that what these chahu dancers do is they perform the mythological stories of india like ramayana and mahabharata they select themes from this and they through their dance drama they perform these uh, practices and in fact it has a lot of mythological basis to it then the usual musical instruments which are part of this are dhol shehnai and dhamsa dhol shehnai uh, and dhamsa and it is usually performed during the gajan festival which is dedicated to lord shiva and when it comes to this dance form the three local traditions they have differences among themselves the three traditions are known as i'll tell the names for you okay uh, the bengal uh, chahu is known as parolia chahu Sarikela uh, Saraikela Chahu is of Jharkhand and Mayurban Chahu is of Odisha Parulia Chahu of Bengal Sarikela Chahu of Jharkhand and Mayurban Chahu of Odisha region three different chahus and when it comes to these chahus some of these chahus they use masks in order to represent the divinities the first and foremost the, the mask usage is seen only in Parulia and Sarikela Chahu whereas in Mayur Mayurban Chahu there is no usage of mask and apart from that that they uh, what they do is they they actually uh, tend to this uh, format of chahu dance format it tends to spread the hindu ideals of dharma among the people spread the hindu ideals of dharma among the people then along with that uh, usually they there are some elements of martial uh, dances also as part of this chahu apart from martial dances some of the important aspects of life like the daily village life and then uh, the movements of animals all of these things are performed as part of chahu dance form chahu dance form and it is considered to be very significant in the for, in uh, in light of 
the practice of a tribals in the practice of a tribals it is very significant if you have a look at the images which are associated with the chahu dance this is the mayurban chahu it has it is performed by both men and women then here you can see the face mask okay lion mask and durga devi mask they are also worn as part of this uh, chahu dance okay these are most of the masks are made by a specific community by the name of sudradara community and they have a specific format of making these masks and today nowadays they are being made with the help of paper with the help of paper and this is a very famous dance format along with a colorful attire see look at the attire which has been worn by these chahu dancers it is a very significant intangible heritage of india which shows a fusion between the classical and folk traditions and this is also part of the process of uh, hinduization of a tribals of india wherein some of the folk dances of the tribals were also taken over by the classical hindu tradition and the mythological stories of hindu tradition are being performed by these tribal by these tribal communities so that is the reason why this chahu dance form is very prominent for us next we will move towards the next dance form which is kalbeliya kalbeliya which is a famous dance form of rajasthan you might have seen this in many movies too this kalbeliya dance form it is typically performed by the snake charmers of rajasthan region typically who are considered to be the so called untouchable communities of indian society but this kalbeliya dance form it is a highly sensualized dance format and this dance is typically done by the women of the kalbeliya community and the men usually use uh, or the men usually who used to perform snake charming earlier they continue this uh, same thing they uh, continue this uh, same th- uh, same pungi okay pungi is the musical instrument through which they play the music to which the kalbeliya women they dance usually they have a very colorful tribal attire and uh, tribal attire and along with that these people they are a migratory community who shift from one place to another uh, with the help of a teras and in wherever they go in market places they start performing this kalbeliya dance form and it is a very prominent sensuous dance of rajasthan and it also has been included, included as the intangible culture heritage of uh, india Okay, there is no uh, classical element in it in it it is a completely a folk dance format colorful dresses the women folk are the main dancers so that is why Kal- kalbeliya has also kalbeliya also has been included as part of this uh, unesco world heritage site the next one is uh, the ramanna ramanna is a very important uh, uh, religious festival of garhwal himalayas garhwal himalayas in uttarakhand garhwal himalayas in uttarakhand and it is performed very specifically by a small village cluster by the name of salur dungra village it is not performed widely in uttarakhand it is performed only in one village and only 1800 people and 196 families they follow this practice of ramanna or raman okay when it comes to this raman uh, it is usually con- uh, performed during the hindu month of baishakhi just before the harvest fe- uh, festival just before the harvest festival in order to uh, in order to pray to the bhumiyal devta who is uh, the traditional deity of this uh, uh, garhwal himalayan region okay bhumiyal devta i think i have written it here bhumiyal devta in order to uh, in order to thank her for the bountiful harvest they perform this ramana festival and here in this ramana festival also they pick up the themes from hindu mythology like ramayana and mahabharata and they perform typically a drama okay along with a dance and in this uh, dance drama format each community has a specific role every caste performs one specific role when it comes to this ramana festival and that is how it shows the community community solidarity and integration as part of this tradition and typically they they also wear some of the masks you see you have uh, written some information nearly 18 people play 18 characters within wearing 18 different masks and uh, they celebrate to 18 different beats as part of this uh, tradition and when it comes to this uh, ramana festival i talked about how it uh, shows community integration and i'll show some images okay this is a very unique festival format of garhwal himalayas in uttarakhand okay this is uh, the flag post and then the villagers in their traditional attire the dance and they act to the ramayana festival and typically it also signifies or shows the victory of rama over ravana and this is performed during night time nearly for a, more than a week this ramayana festival the celebrations they continue then the next one is ramlila ramlila is a very prominent uh, play of uh, play in a uh, public play in uh, uttar pradesh and bihar regions bihar regions prominently and now it has it is being practiced across the world because there are indentured migrants from india 
who went from India and particularly this UP Bihar belt to various parts of the world uh, like Mauritius there also this uh, Ram Lila is practiced today and this Ram Lila as a practice during ancient and medieval times itself it has gone to Indonesia where the Hindu population of Bali region they also practice this Ram Lila this Ram Lila is a uh, typically the reenactment of the story of Rama during the Dasara festival nearly for nine days the entire story of Rama it is a uh, uh, enacted as part of this play and today um, as part of this uh, Ram Lila, people uh, Ram Lila committees are usually formed in various regions, and these Ram Lila committees they hire actors and they integrate the modern music and the traditional classical music also as part of this uh, Ramayana play. And at the end of this play, what they do is they typically show the winning of good over evil, which is based on the dharmic pr principles of Hinduism. And at the end of this, they burn a huge effigy, okay, of uh, Ravana and Kumbhakarna, which shows that the evil will be destroyed in front of the good so that is how uh, this Ramlila festival is typically conducted during the Dasara festival during the Dasara festival or during the Navaratri festival uh, okay I talked about it and usually some of these uh, the things Ramlila you can also see the paper mesh masks are also used as part of this Ramlila and some of the prominent actors of Bollywood like of today like Nawajuddin Siddiqui they also started as part of the uh, as part of uh, or they played various roles in this Ram Lila. Okay, and now this is the Ram Lila, the story of Ramayan. I think you might be knowing this is also part of the UNESCO Intangible Heritage. The next one is Kutiyattam. Kutiyattam is a very, very important play practice of Kerala region. Kutiyattam is the only surviving Sanskrit drama tradition of India. No other Sanskrit drama tradition of ancient India it survived except for this format which is known as Kutiyattam. This Kutiyattam is this Kutiyattam is typically performed by the people who belong to a specific community, particularly the males they belong to the Chekyar community, whereas the women they belong to Nambiar caste. The women they belong to Nambiar caste. And when it comes to Kerala theatrical practices, uh, one is uh, this Kutiyattam, the other one is Chekyar Kutu and the third one is Muriyattam. The third one is Muriyattam and two of these uh, they have been included as part of Intangible Cultural Heritage of India and here when it comes to this, pra this practice of Kutiyattam it is uh, a Sanskrit play along with the Sanskrit uh, later days some of the elements of Malayalam also in are integrated into this Sanskrit play. The, all the characters who are very very prominent in the play like uh, the heroes and heroines uh, and the and the gods and goddesses they speak in Sanskrit whereas the uh, comic characters like Vidushaka they speak in Malayalam and they typically set the context for the play and after setting the context for the play the actors they enact it in Sanskrit dramatical tradition classical Sanskrit dramatic tradition which has been laid down in Natya Shastra is still followed in Kerala and when it comes to this they are typically performed in the temple premises the temple premises which are known as Kutambalams. Okay, if there is a, some mistake in my pronunciation, uh, because I'm not non-native speaker, it uh, I think uh, you should be considerate about it. Then uh, these are known as Kutambalams. Kutambalams is the place where this uh, Sanskrit uh, drama is played, and typically these plays they are not full plays. In fact, they just select some of the acts of prominent plays and they perform them over many days okay for example they take up a place like Bashasa, Abhishek and Pratima, Harshas, Naganand all of these plays they take up and they don't enact the entire play they just take up one or two acts of the play and they enact them in an elaborate fashion and a very stylized fashion along with the musical instruments along with the new musical instruments see uh, in fact the musical instruments which are used are one is Kujitalam okay Kujitalam is one musical instrument and the second important musical instrument which is part of this is Mijhavu. Mijhavu is the second important one and the uh, Kudiyatam as it is practiced today it has been developed by a person by the name of Kulashekar Varman, uh, Varma Charman Perumal and it is written down in a book uh, called Ata Prakaram. Ata Prakaram is a book which is written by this Kulashekara Varma Charman Perumal and it writes about this Sanskrit dramatical tradition and it also takes up some of the elements of the Sangam era place too. So it is an interaction between the high Sanskrit tradition and the Tamilian tradition. It is It lies at the intermixture of these things and the characters also speak different languages based on the context, based on the context and I talked about how only a few of 
uh, few of the acts of an entire player played and initially it was performed nearly for 41 days 41 nights okay but now it has reduced its size and now it is typically finished in four or five days four or five days i'll show some of the images the headgear and the decoration it is very much similar to our the uh, kathakali dance format and uh, the musical instruments also accompany this uh, uh, format kutumbalans is important chakyars and uh, nambiar caste women are part of this play Okay, they also wear huge masks too and facial painting all of these are also part then the next important one is Muriat too Muriat which is farm uh, which also is a ritual theater of Kerala region and here this enactment of the mythological story of the fight between goddess Kali and Demon Darika is taken up okay Demon Darika he is a he is he go, he gets a boon from Lord Brahma saying that you will not be killed by any man in the world so that is the reason why uh, Lord Shiva he asks Parvati to take the format of goddess Kali Kali in order to kill this uh, Demon Darika and usually it is performed by uh, the Marar and Karupa communities who belong to the uh, Tirsur, Ernakulam, Kottayam and Idukki districts of Kerala very very small population okay it is not uh, performed across Kerala to only a few communities and usually what they do is they in fact uh, the the entire play format it is uh, for organized in a format of wherein first the goddess Kali's image is made in the format of a Rangoli then after that there will be a Carnatic music recital after the Carnatic music recital the drama pattern of Mudia 2 it starts and in this Mudia 2 format too the people they wear elaborate facial makeup and it is also a highly stylized format along with music dance and drama so all of these things are part of this and Sopana Sangeeta is the Carnatic music which accompanies the Mudia 2 format and usually they are performed in Bhagavati Kavus Bhagavati Kavu is the temple for Kali Mata is the temple for Kali Mata so this is one more important ritual theater of Kerala. This is the Rangoli and this is the highly stylized format of the demon. Okay. Darika. Next uh, important uh, one is one uh, traditional practice of India also has been part of the intangible cultural heritage which is known as the Thateras. The uh, traditional brass and copper craft of uh, Thateras of Jandiyala Guru in Punjab. Thateras are the traditional community which makes this uh, uh, copper and brass instruments along with uh, the, the instruments which are made of kansa which is an alloy of which is an alloy of copper tin and zinc so this is the traditional uh, craft making or utensil making practice of india and as part of this uh, uh, copper and brass instruments are made and they follow the traditional uh, indian Ayurvedic practices because in Ayurveda copper and brass are considered to be metals which are very beneficial for the humans that is the reason why these uh, things are made and in fact these uh, Thateras of, of Jandial Guru in Punjab who are a Sikh community they follow the traditional method of making this uh, uh, copper and bronze utensils copper and bronze utensils what they do is they follow uh, the traditional practice of taking the cake or uh, the bronze cake and after that they flatten it with the help of hand hands and hammers then they heat them with the help of bellows and small uh, stoves then after that they design them very intricately very intricately they design with the help of wood planks and finally the pro final product is made today there is a major challenge to uh, this Thateras of Jandiala Guru in Punjab because of the com commercial unviability of their uh, practice but even now there are some people who patronize this art who patronize this art form that is the reason why UNESCO has integrated this traditional brass and copper crafts of Tateras of Jandial Guru in Punjab as part of intangible cultural heritage of India this finishes the lecture on intangible cultural heritage I have nearly posted see this is the uh, huge uh, cauldron which has been made by the Tateras of Punjab and finally uh, I have posted two questions as part in the comment section below please do solve them and subscribe to manifest for more such interesting and educative content thank you